In this lecture, we'll be discussing how to write a thesis statement and create an outline. So first of all, in a typical historical question, you pose a question, you then answer it with a thesis supported by historical evidence. Right, so the beginning, you make it clear that you are answering a question, that's your thesis, so you also have to make clear what your question is, and then you've got all the evidence to support it. Right, so this is the key thing, you have to actually say something. Right, you, you have to have a question that is raising some historical question or problem, and then you actually have to answer it and prove that your answer is correct. So to do that, it's very important that you think deeply and critically. This is why doing things like taking notes, reading very carefully, and just taking time to think things through can make a better paper, right? It, you can't come up with a question. You certainly can't answer the question unless you know something about the topic and, and then also have thought deeply and critically about what you do know. Now, there are some criteria a question or a thesis must meet, right? There's some criteria, and this can help you think about what makes a good thesis statement, what makes a good question. First of all, it has to be something that can be argued with. The American Civil War lasted from 1861 to 1865 really is a difficult one to argue with. I mean, you could maybe try and argue that it begins a little earlier or later or something like that, but for the most part, that's just a question of fact, right? It's difficult to argue with simple questions of fact, right? Abraham Lincoln uh, was assassinated. That's not, you know, was Abraham Lincoln assassinated? That's not really a good uh, question, right? And you can't really get a good thesis off that because you can't really argue with that. It also has to be narrow enough that it can be answered in a paper, right? So for example, um, you know, I've had students say, you know, I want to write my paper about the Holocaust. It's like, okay, you could write a multi-volume history, like bo several books about the Holocaust. You can't answer that question in a single paper. You could maybe study some small aspect of the Holocaust in a paper. That could work. But you can't do the whole thing, right? My paper is going to be on World War II. Well, what part of World War II, right? Again, you could write multi-volume books about World War II. It also must, the uh, question, the thesis that it's based upon have to be answerable based on available evidence. Uh, sometimes people come up with really neat uh, ideas for a paper, but they can't do the paper, they can't write the paper because there's just not evidence for it. Right? You, Unless there's the records, you can't look at it, and the records have to be in something, uh, a language that you can read. So you might be very interested in looking at Chinese communist perspectives on the Korean War. That's going to be limited based on your ability to read Chinese or to find English translations, right? So you have to think, can I actually answer this question based on the evidence? That's why I often encourage people to look for primary sources in a general topic and then make their question around the primary source. It also has to be clearly identifiable in your paper, right? Generally, it's got to be in that first or second paragraph. It has to be clear. I had to be able to point and say, okay, this is what this person is trying to argue for. This is the question. This is the answer. And the thing is, if these are missing, your paper will not make sense, right? If you don't have a clear question, if you don't have a clear answer to that question, your paper is just going to be a bunch of stuff with nothing unifying it. So it's key that you come up with a question and that you have a clear thesis answering that question. Now, it's really hard to do this, right? It is not easy to do this at all. It is extraordinarily difficult to write an introduction. I think that's the hardest part of the paper. And it's especially hard to write an introduction when it, you're required to have a clear question and thesis. One way to deal with this is through what we would call a formula, right? A formula. Now, why do I have a picture of Scooby-Doo here talking about formulas? Well, think about this. You've probably watched a Scooby-Doo cartoon. It always ends up, begins with the gang um, going someplace and they find a mystery. And it's always like, you know, it's like a, it's an amusement park or a circus or a ski lodge, a castle. They go there and they discover there's a mystery and they decide to stick around. And in the pr cartoon, there will always be a chase scene, right? They're always chased at one point. There's a trap that they try and set to catch the person uh, who's committing, who's committed the crime. Uh, the trap always fails, but they catch him some 
other way. And then in the end, they, you know, they, they take out the person's mask and they, and, you know, if it wasn't for those meddling kids. The point is that makes it really easy to write a Scooby-Doo episode, right? You need to start off. Okay, where are the, where's the, where, where are the Scooby-Doo kids going to go this time? Okay, they're going to go to this place. Okay, what would, you know, they're going to go to a circus. Well, what's a good um, villain at a circus? Well, a clown. Okay, great. You know, we're halfway there. So the key thing in writing your papers, I think, is to think of a formula and how to fill that in. So the way I do this, usually when I have a paper, I try and start off with an anecdote or question that raises a problem. For example, in one paper, I was looking, trying to look from the Korean government's perspective to try and figure out why did they execute Catholics? And the way I illustrate that was I started with an execution. I said, you know, and described how in 1839, the Korean government uh, executed a, a 60 year old woman by decapitation uh, for being a Catholic. And she had not done anything other than be a Catholic. And it's like, okay, what could be so bad about this religion that would cause them to do something that seems so terrible, right? The idea of that story, it captures the reader's attention right away. You never want to start off with, my paper is on the topic, or my presentation is on, that's a terrible way to start a paper or a presentation, yawn, right? You want an anecdote or a quote that raises the problem, that makes it clear what kind of historical problem, what kind of question you're going to be dealing with. So in that case, you know, my question was, how, why is that, what was, did the government think about Catholicism that would make them execute a woman like this? You know, the 60 year old grandma, um, or I shouldn't say grandma, a 60 year old woman. I don't know if she had kids or not. It's not recorded, I believe. Um, the 60 year old woman, why would they execute this person? And so I, I had the anecdote talking about the woman. And then I say, why would the government do this? What was so bad about Catholicism? And then the thesis is the answer to the question. And I then went through government documents showing how the mere existence of Catholicism was seen as bad. That Catholicism was treated as like a, a dangerous, uh, like, a, like a kind of plague or like animals. That's how the government viewed Catholicism. So that even an, an old woman suddenly became dangerous because she was a carrier for this disease in a sense, this contagion. So then you have your thesis answering the question. That's how you can kind of do your introduction. And when you do it with this kind of formula, it makes things easier. So let me give you a, a more kind of concrete example. So I'm looking at in this, uh, I wrote an article looking at this man, Father Capon. And I was very interested in doing something on him. He's a, a Catholic priest who received the Medal of Honor. There's an effort to canonize him. Uh, he died during the Korean War in a Chinese prison camp. And... Um, I wanted to do something on him. I knew there were the sources. So I was looking at the sources and I was looking at information. And one thing I found that was fascinating was that there was a statue dedicated to him. And I'll just read it here. At his home parish in Pilsen, Kansas, that stands a statue in honor of Father Emil Capon, a Catholic priest and military chaplain who died in a POW camp during the Korean War, inscribed with the words, all man, all priest. Right? This is my anecdote. This is a curious inscription since Catholic priests are by definition men. Thus, by referring to him as all man, the statue is not so much asserting his biological, se se biological sex, but his fulfillment of a particular form of masculinity. In fact, in its emphasis on Capon's masculinity, the statue is being faithful to how he was remembered by his contemporaries. For instance, one Jewish POW who had been very close to Father Capon stressed that as a Jew, his feelings for Father were not clouded by any religious affiliation, but instead, the relationship was based purely on a man-to-man -man basis, and he was completely and solely impressed by father as a man. The title father was therefore not so much religious in nature for this POW, but a reflection of the role Capon played as a man. Right. So just by bringing up this issue, this anecdote, it raises the problem. What's going on here? Why make a big deal about a Catholic priest being a man when Catholic priests are by definition men? Right, what's going on here? So then all I had to do was rephrase this into a question and then have a thesis answering it. So there's my question. Why was Capon remembered in such masculine terms? Why did they make a big deal about this? Now, my thesis statement's going to be a little bit longer and complex than yours might be. But you can see I'm, I'm going to try and answer this question. Why was Capon remembered in such masculine terms? This paper will argue that Cold War anxieties about masculinity, 
led to ideals of men as fathers that caused people to perceive Capon's effort to live out his priesthood in distinctly masculine ways. So I'm trying to argue that people were nervous, were afraid during the Cold War. Uh, I talked about this more in the paper, but there was this, this fear that men were becoming weak. And so they wanted to emphasize this idea of being a masculine man, but you didn't want to be violent, right? It was like, how do we emphasize a masculinity that is going to be about protect, that's about strength and force, but is um, not about like violence. And the way they did that was by emphasizing fatherhood, right? The father is strong, but is also nurturing. So it will do this by examining Cold War anxieties and ideals of masculinity and Capon's own understanding of priesthood and the reveal through the memories of those who knew Capon how a Cold War masculine image of Capon was constructed. Then this article will analyze the 1955 episode of the religious program Crossroads entitled The Good Thief, which is based on Capon's life and death in the POW camp. Contrasting how Capon was portrayed in this television program with his actual actions will both reveal by way of contrast the religious memories of Capon and how those memories were suppressed in this program to make him better fit the Cold War masculine ideal and show how religion could help defeat the communist menace, thereby illustrating how religious memories were powerful enough to depart from anti-communist masculinity without being able to overcome it. Finally, this paper will end with an overview of the role gender has played and how Kapan has been remembered in another place, South Korea, and time, the United States since the Cold War. So this is a little bit more complex than you, what you would need to do, right? And especially in a long article, this article is like 10, 12,000 words. I have to give kind of an overview of what um, I'm going to be doing. But the key thing here is I got my question, why was Kapan remembered in such mas masculine terms? And then I have my argument. This paper will argue that Cold War anxieties about masculinity led to ideals of men as fathers that caused people to perceive Capon's effort to live out his priesthood in indistinctly masculine ways. And I explain how I'm going to do this, but basically I'm looking at how Capon didn't really think of himself this way. He didn't emphasize himself as a manly man, but then I showed how others do. And I also engaged in some kind of comparison and contrast because there are different ways that he's remembered by different people. And part of my larger point is, why are people remembering him in these different ways? And a lot of it, again, has to do with the, how you, people viewed the Cold War, how they viewed religion, and the relationship between religion and patriotism. Right? I don't want to go too much. The point of this is not so much the article. This is just meant to illustrate. But you know, right, we're in, I've only gone through one paragraph, two paragraphs, and you know what my paper's about. You know what my paper's going to do. That's key with your paper. When you write your question, your thesis, it all has to be very clear what you're going to be doing. Now, that was just the first part, right? We also need to talk about the outline, right? We're looking at how to write a thesis statement, how to make an outline. So for this paper, the outline, I could basically divide it into like five parts. Part one, background information about the time period with a focus on Catholicism and anxieties about masculinity and the Cold War and a bit about Capon himself. That's the first part. I want to stress here, usually even though this is the first part in a paper, it is the last part you write. You may say, well, why? And the answer is simple. You don't know what to write until you're done. Right? How will you know what the background information needs to be provided to understand a paper when the rest of the paper isn't hasn't been written yet? Right? You need to explain. That, so this part comes last, so you know what to put in. Otherwise, you're going to spend a lot of time writing the background, not enough time writing the meat of the paper. Right? The background is just there to give us an enough information that we can understand what your paper is about. In the second part, um, I provided evidence showing Capon's focus on spiritual concerns and efforts to fulfill his duties as a priest and a lack of concern with his own masculinity. He just didn't think about what it was to be a man. He's not concerned um, at least in his own case. He was very concerned with being a good priest, though. Right? But my key point here is he's not thinking so much in terms of masculinity. He's thinking, how do I be a good priest? In part three, I look at remembrance of POWs showing how Capon was remembered in a distinctly masculine way. Right? And we already, I already gave a clue, right? To help make my point earlier, remember, I included the quote by a Jewish soldier who would not really, I mean, he would maybe call Father Capon father out of politeness, but he doesn't think of him as a spiritual father. He doesn't really care about, you know, how Catholicism works. But he emphasized he still thought of him as a father, but more like a biological father, one, someone who will protect his children. 
in part four, then I look at an episode of t- a television show, in which father Capon is presented in a very manly way and other such memories of non POWs. And I don't have it here, but what's fascinating is they tend to be more, uh, they tend to be even more secular, right? So there's this kind of, you can see how I'm showing some differences here. Uh, Capon is very interested in religion. The POWs kind of mix religion and secular, um, in part four, it's becoming much, much more secular, which I think is interesting. And in the conclusion, kind of part five, I show the contrast between these more clearly and I describe the significance. Now, in a conclusion, you need to repeat what you've done before. You need to restate your argument, but it's also good to talk about the significance. So here's what I have. Thus, the Cold War a- a- ideals and the anxieties that gave birth to them shape contemporary memories of Emil Capon as a masculine father, just as changing ideals of masculinity have led to him being comfortably treated as a brother and mother today, right? He's portrayed a lot differently today. And yet, despite the powerful influence of anti-communism and discourse about gender, strong enough to influence the 1952 presidential race, they were not the sole factors in constructing memories of Father Capon. There also existed a religious understanding that could exist apart from them or merge with gender in complex ways. While not as powerful and to a certain degree subsumed and overshadowed, a religious narrative of Father Emil Capon, one that embraced ideals of love of enemy and of forgiveness, not only giving but also asking for it, survived that, not, uh, that did not align with and even implicitly rejected important aspects of Cold War understands of masculinity, showing that not all was subsumed under anti-communism, and for many Americans that label said much about what they were against, but very little about who they were or what they stood for. So my point here, what I was trying to make, you know, I, I've gone through and I proved all these things. I think I've sh- answered my question well. I provide enough evidence. I'm trying to go a little bit deeper in the conclusion to say why this is important. What does this mean for how we understand the Cold War and religion? And my point here, sometimes people just are kind of like, well, the Cold War was like a religious war where religion was in charge, or they tend to emphasize how, um, for many people, patriotism Uh, anti-communism and religion all were kind of the same thing. And I'm trying to say, no, it was more complex than that. Right. Um, So for example, one thing I think is fascinating is that the more religious um, narratives of father Emil Capon emphasized how he actually asked his captors for forgiveness. So even the, the secular narratives emphasized how he forgave his captors. He forgave the people who treated him very badly but only the really religious ones emphasized him asking for forgiveness from the communists. That was not allowed in your typical anti-communist narrative, but it works in a Christian, a Catholic narrative. It makes a lot of sense there. So I was just trying to complicate that relationship. You don't have to do anything necessarily that complex, but the point is, right, you've got your introduction that raises a question I think the best way to do that is through an anecdote and or a quote. You have your thesis answering that question, and then you have a conclusion which restates your question and thesis and then explains, so what? Why is your paper important? How does it help us to deeper, more deeply understand this part of history and connect to bigger uh, understandings of history?